I'm Thomas Plunkett, and this is part. This episode is part of the Understanding Crypto series. Um, so right now, I'm going to focus on understanding Chapter One of Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. This is a great textbook, which you can find uh, uh, for free on GitHub at GitHub.com/slash/BitcoinBook. Um, and it's made available on GitHub under a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, and this video is also made available under that same license, as well as the slide deck I'm sharing right here, which is based on the textbook that's available on GitHub. So Bitcoin was announced on October 31, 2008 uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto, who's, and that's a pseudonym for, uh, for the creator of Bitcoin. We don't know um, whether the creator is a man or a woman or a group of people. Um, but in a internet user group, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, introduced the Bitcoin concept uh, with the following words. I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. And then he attached a white paper of you know, roughly eight pages of technical text describing his system. Uh, and that white paper was released on Halloween of 2008, and he described it as Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic system. Uh, the Bitcoin software was publicly released on SourceForge, and the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network was publicly launched on January 9th, 2009. Now, he or they had probably been working on Bitcoin for quite a while. Uh, the Bitcoin org domain name was registered in August of 2008, so it was at least working on it back to August, and in some internet uh, comments, um, he claimed he'd been working on it for a couple of years. Um, but as I said earlier, nobody really knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is or whether he or she or they are even still alive. Um, so approximately a little over a year later, the first commercial transaction occurred for Bitcoin in 2010 when two pizzas uh, were traded for 10,000 uh, Bitcoins. Now, nowadays, of course, the Bitcoin price has gone up dramatically since 2010. Um, 11 years later, in 2021, Bitcoin has uh, been as expensive as in the 60,000s. Um, right now, I think it's around 30,000. Uh, but still, you can get a lot of pizzas for a single Bitcoin. Uh, but 10 years ago, it was 5,000 Bitcoins per pizza. Yeah, so in those days, a Bitcoin was worth less than a penny, whereas now you're talking Thirty to sixty thousand dollars for Bitcoin, depending on what time this year you're talking. Um, let's dive a little bit more deeper into the history of Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, as I mentioned, Bitcoin was invented in two thousand eight uh, with the white paper. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto combined several prior inventions, including uh, B money and hash cash, to create a completely decentralized electronic cash system that does not rely on a central authority for currency issuance or settlement and validation of transactions. Uh, one of Satoshi's key innovations was to use a distributed computation system, uh, referred to as a proof of work algorithm, to conduct a global election every 10 minutes, allowing the decentralized network to arrive at consensus about the state of transactions. That solved the issue of a double spend uh, where a single currency unit can be spent twice. Double spending is the equivalent of counterfeiting. Um, the idea is, you know, you would use money that you were allocated um, to do multiple things, you know, essentially counterfeiting the money. And so that's a key problem that any sort of electronic cash system has to prevent. Um, the double spend problem has been a weakness for all digital currencies prior to Bitcoin. Um, and was typically dealt with by clearing transactions through a central clearinghouse. Um, since the Bitcoin network started in 2009, based on the uh, initial reference implementation created by uh, Nakamoto, um, it has been revised by a number of other programmers. In fact, Nakamoto stopped uh, working on the project many years ago, and other people work on it today. The implementation of the proof of work uh, which is uh, sometimes referred to as mining, uh, provides security and resilience for Bitcoin. And it's increased exponentially over the last 12 years. Uh, originally in 2009, Satoshi was the only one who was running a computer to mine Bitcoins. 
Today, there are thousands of computers uh, mining Bitcoins, exceeding the combined processing power of the world's top supercomputers. Um, there have been a lot of interest in Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, Bitcoin's total market value has at times exceeded $1 trillion in US dollars, depending on the Bitcoin to dollar exchange rate. Uh, um, there have been transactions of over $1 billion in size, transmitted instantly over the Bitcoin uh, network for a transaction fee of less than a dollar. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto withdrew from the public in April 2011 leaving the responsibility of developing the code and network to uh, open source volunteers. The identity, or uh, as I mentioned, we still don't know who or the, he or they are. Uh, nobody really has uh, individual control over the Bitcoin system. Instead, it's, um, depend, it operates based on the mathematical principles, the open source code and consensus among the participants. Um, this uh, creation uh, is groundbreaking and has spawned new science in the fields of distributed computing, economics, and others. And you can also look at um, the creation of Bitcoin as being a practical solution to a problem in distributed computing uh, known as the Byzantine General's problem. Uh, briefly, the uh, Byzantine General's problem consists of trying to agree on a course of action or the state of a system by exchanging information over a reliable and potentially compromised network. Um, it's referred to um, as Byzantine generals because the idea was you had multiple generals who were on different sides of Constantinople and they wanted to attack, but how could they communicate with each other to time their attacks to work in sequence? Um, and, um, and so the question is, do we both attack at the same time or do we uh, both retreat at the same time? And how do you communicate uh, when the Byzantine city in between the two armies might uh, intercept the messages and change the messages. Um, and so Satoshi Nakamoto came up with a decentralized consensus approach that enabled uh, the parties to reach consensus even when they don't ha they have a potentially compromised network. Uh, and this is the potential problem with an electronic cash system that's peer-to-peer -peer across the internet is there may be hackers and other bad parties in the network. And so how do you solve that problem? So Satoshi Nakamoto's solution to that problem is to use the concept of proof of work to achieve consensus without a central trusted authority. Um, and now this approach to decentralized consensus can have applicability in other distributed computing areas beyond currency. It can be used to prove the fairness of elections, lotteries, asset registries, digital notation, and more. So, all right, that's a little bit about the history of Bitcoin, but let's dive in a little deeper. What exactly is Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is a collection of concepts and technologies that form the basis of electronic cash or digital money ecosystem. Uh, units of currency called Bitcoin are used to store and transmit value among the participants in the Bitcoin network. Uh, Bitcoin users communicate with each other using the Bitcoin protocol over the internet. Uh, the Bitcoin protocol stack is available as open source software and it can run on a wide range of computing devices, including laptops and smartphones, making the technology accessible to a wide range of people. Users can transfer Bitcoin over the network to do just about anything that can be done with conventional currencies, including buying and selling goods, sending money to people, or organizations, or extending credit. Bitcoin can be purchased, sold, and exchanged for other currencies at specialized currency exchanges. Bitcoin, in a sense, is a great form of money for the internet because it's fast, secure, and borderless. Unlike traditional currencies like the dollar and the euro, Bitcoin is entirely virtual. There are no physical coins or even uh, or paper money or even digital coins. The coins are implied in transactions that transfer value from the sender to the recipient. Users of Bitcoin own uh, private keys that allow them to prove ownership of Bitcoin in the Bitcoin network. With these private keys, they can sign transactions to unlock the value and spend it by transferring 
uh, the currency to a new owner. Private keys are often stored in a digital wallet on each user's computer or smartphone. Possession of the private key that can sign a transaction is the prerequisite to spending Bitcoin. Uh, putting the control over the currency entirely in the hands of each user based on their possession of their private keys. Bitcoin is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system. As such, there's no central server or peer point of control because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, Bitcoins, i.e. the units of uh, currency called Bitcoin, are created through this process called mining, which we talked about earlier, which involves competing to find solutions to a mathematical problem while processing Bitcoin transactions. Any participant in the Bitcoin network, i.e. anyone using a device running the full Bitcoin protocol stack, can operate as a miner using their computer's processing power to verify and record transactions. Every 10 minutes on average, a Bitcoin miner uh, will validate the transactions of the past 10 minutes and is rewarded with brand new Bitcoin. Um, although they're randomly selected, so it's only one miner out of all the miners worldwide who's receiving that reward. Essentially, Bitcoin mining decentralizes the currency issuance and clearing functions of a central bank and replaces a need for a central bank like the Federal Reserve. The Bitcoin protocol includes built-in algorithms that regulate the mining function uh, across the network. The difficulty of the processing tasks that miners must perform is adjusted dynamically so that on average, someone succeeds every 10 minutes, regardless of how many miners and how much processing are competing at any moment. The protocol also halves the rate at which new Bitcoin are created every four years and limits the total number of Bitcoin that will be created over time to a fixed total just below 21 million coins. The result is that the number of Bitcoin in circulation follows an easily predictable curve that will approach the 21 million target by the year 2140. Due to Bitcoin's diminishing rate of issuance over the long term, the Bitcoin currency is considered deflationary. Uh, furthermore, Bitcoin cannot be inflated by printing new money above and beyond the expected issuance rate unless uh, the open source software were to be modified. Uh, which would require you know, consensus among all the parties in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Behind the scenes, Bitcoin is also the name of the protocol, a peer-to-peer -peer network, and a distributed computing innovation. The Bitcoin currency is really only the first application of this invention. Bitcoin represents a combination of decades of research in cryptography and distributed systems, and includes several key innovations brought together in a, in a powerful combination. So Bitcoin consists of the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network based on the Bitcoin protocol, um, a public transaction lecture, which is the, sometimes referred to as the blockchain, and is a record of all the transactions involving Bitcoin that has taken place across the network, a set of rules for independent transaction validation and currency issuance. So these are our consensus rules for how transactions are brought into the blockchain and validated and a mechanism for reaching global decentralized consensus on the valid blockchain, the proof of work algorithm, which again uh, is part of the consensus rules we just mentioned in the previous bullet. Uh, from a software development perspective, Bitcoin can be thought of as almost like the internet of money, a network for propagating value and securing the ownership of digital assets through distributed computation. So let's talk a bit more about Bitcoin as um, currency. But before we do that, let's talk about digital currencies before Bitcoin. So the emergence of viable digital money has been correlated with uh, the evolution of cryptography. Um, and if you think about it, and that's one of the reasons why Bitcoin is sometimes referred to as a cryptocurrency. Um, this relationship between uh, eCash and cryptography makes sense when you think about the fundamental challenges involved with using uh, digital bits to represent value that can be exchanged for goods and services. Um, you know, some of the questions that a merchant who is accepting uh, digital currency would ask is, can I trust as a merchant that this money coming in from my goods is authentic and not counterfeit money? Can I trust that the digital money um, you know, isn't being counterfeited by someone. Again, that's the same question. And can I be sure that no one else can claim this money belongs to them and not me? 
Um, issuers of paper money are constantly battling the counterfeiting problem. If you look at a dollar bill, it's got a number of built-in uh, aspects to deal with preventing counterfeiting. Uh, physical money addresses the double spend issue because the idea is that the same dollar bill can't be spent in two places at once. Um, but, you know, conventional money can be stored and transmitted digitally, in which case um, the double spend issue is handled through central authorities like the Federal Reserve that have a global view of the currency in circulation. Uh, for digital money, which cannot take advantage of things like uh, esoteric inks or holographic scripts that are used in traditional dollar bills, cryptography will be a substitute, providing the basis for tr trusting the legitimacy of a user's claim to value. Um, and the specific cryptographic technology that is used in Bitcoin to do this is referred to as a digital signature. A digital signature enables a user to sign a digital asset or transaction, proving the ownership of that asset. With the appropriate architecture, digital signatures can be used to address the double spending issue that Satoshi Nakamoto was concerned with. Uh, when cryptography first started becoming more broadly available and understood in the late 1980s, many researchers tried to use cryptography to build digital currencies. All the early digital currency projects issued digital money, usually backed by a national currency or a precious metal such as gold. Although these early digital currencies uh, worked, in many cases they were centralized and supported by a government or a bank or a business, and as a result, um, they were relatively easy to be shut down by governments. Uh, early digital currencies used a central clearance house to settle all transactions, just like a traditional banking system. In most cases, those uh, early digital currencies were shut down by governments and litigated out of existence. Uh, some of those uh, projects failed spectacularly when the parent company lit li liquidated and went into bankruptcy. So to be robust against intervention uh, from antagonists, whether legitimate governments or hackers, a decentralized digital currency is needed to avoid a single point of attack. Bitcoin is decentralized by design and free of any central authority or point of control that could be attacked or corrupted. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be hacked. Um, there are some security issues with Bitcoin, and we'll talk about those later. But most of those are around the on-ramp and off-ramp to Bitcoin. So some comments about Bitcoin. Users can transfer Bitcoin over the network to do just about anything that they can do with conventional currencies. They can, you know, Bitcoin is fast, secure, and borderless, making it perfect for the internet. It's entirely virtual, and we're using these keys to prove ownership. And again, uh, a Satoshi uh, is the smallest unit of Bitcoin, which is uh, shown here. It's you know seven zeros uh, and then a one for BTC. We talked about the fact that the Bitcoin network is a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system. Bitcoins are created through a mining process and miners lend their computers resources to participate in the network activity be rewarded with new Bitcoins. And mining is regulated by the built-in algorithms. So a Bitcoin wallet is your client application that you would use to work with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a protocol that can be accessed using a client application that speaks to pro Bitcoin protocol. Um, a wallet is the common term we use to describe these user interfaces to the Bitcoin system. Um, just like a web browser is a common UI for interacting with the World Wide Web. There are many implementations and brands of Bitcoin wallets. Um, just like there are many brands of web browsers, you know, like Chrome, Safari, Firefox, IE, and so on. And just like we all have our own, our favorite browsers like Firefox and Chrome and our other browsers we don't like, uh, Bitcoin wallets vary in quality, performance, security, privacy, and reliability. Uh, and there's also a reference implementation of the Bitcoin protocol that includes a wallet which is uh, referred to as Bitcoin Core. So in choosing a Bitcoin wallet, um, there's a wide range of them and you wanna look at um, what specific platforms or uses you have because some, of, some wallets will be more suitable uh, for certain purposes than others. Some are more suitable for certain platforms than others. 
Um, choosing a wallet can be highly subjective depending on your expertise and users. Um, we could all, however, though, without diving into the specific wallet, we can categorize wallets by their types. Um, and so here are the main different types of wallets for looking at from, from a platform perspective. Um, a desktop wallet is the first type of Bitcoin wallet that was created as a reference implementation in Bitcoin Core. And many users today run desktop wallets for the features, autonomy, and control they offer. Uh, running on general use operating systems such as Windows and Mac, uh, there can be some security disadvantages as these platforms, uh, the OS platform may be insecure and poorly configured. A mobile wallet is the most common type of Bitcoin wallet. You can use your Bitcoin on your phone, uh, running on smartphone operating systems such as Apple iOS and Android. These wallets can be a great choice for new users. Many of these wallets uh, are designed for simplicity and ease of use, but they are also fully featured uh, mobile wallets for those who want more capabilities. A web wallet, can be accessed through a web browser. Uh, the wallet is stored on the servers. Um, this is similar to webmail, like uh, you know, on Google Office and so on, and then it relies on a third-party server. Some of these services actually operate client-side code running the user's browser, which would keep the control of the Bitcoin keys in your browser as opposed to on a third-party server but most uh, run a compromise where they take control of the Bitcoin keys from the users in exchange for ease of use. Um, it is not recommended to use web wallets for large amounts of Bitcoin. Hardware wallets are devices that operate a secure self-contained Bitcoin wallet on special purpose hardware, uh, for, you know, perhaps coming, uh, being like a USB device. Uh, they usually connect to a desktop or mobile device through a, a USB cable or a, a near field communication are also operated with a web browser or accompanying software. By handling all the Bitcoin related operations of specialized hardware, these hardware wallets are considered very secure and suitable for storing large amounts of, of Bitcoin. Um, another approach is a paper wallet, which is um, a way of printing your private keys for long-term storage. Uh, these are referred to as paper wallets. So other materials like wood, metal, and so on can be used, but it's not an electronic computer. The advantage of not having your keys on a computer is that it makes it very difficult for a hacker to get access to it unless they physically raid wherever you've stored your keys. Another way to categorize uh, Bitcoin wallets is by the connectivity type and how they uh, interact with the Bitcoin network. Uh, a full node client stores entire history of Bitcoin transactions. Um, you know, every transaction by every user ever in the Bitcoin uh, network. Um, so the full node client can manage the user wallets and can initiate transactions directly on the Bitcoin network. A full node client handles all aspects of the protocol and can independently validate the entire blockchain and transactions. Uh, however, it will consume substantial computer resources, um, you know, several gigs of RAM, probably about, you know, 400 gigs of disk space, uh, but it does offer complete autonomy and independent transaction verification. A lightweight client connects to Bitcoin full nodes um, through for access to the Bitcoin transaction information, but stores the user wallet locally and independently creates, validates, and transmits transactions. It'll interact directly with the Bitcoin network without an intermediary. A lightweight client depends on a special protocol referred to as Simplified Payment Verification, SPV, which we'll talk about later. A third-party API client interacts with Bitcoin through a third-party system of APIs rather than by connecting to the, the Bitcoin network directly. The wallet can be stored by the user or by third-party servers, but all transactions go through a third party. Uh, so, for example, many people who own Bitcoin own it through a third party and are actually at interfacing with their Bitcoin through this third party API client. And so they don't actually have direct ownership of their keys. Combining these characterizations, many Bitcoin wallets fall into a few groups, with the most common being desktop full clients, mobile lightweight wallets, and web third party wallets. The lines between the different categories are often blurry as many wallets run on multiple platforms and can interact with the network in different ways. Um, 
For the purpose of this uh, lecture, we're gonna walk through and take a look at a few different wallets. So let's take a look at um, an example here. So here we have an example where Alice, and, and by the way, in cryptography, our most famous characters in cryptography are referred to as Alice and Bob, or A and B. So in this particular case, Alice wants to store, uh, wants to um, do, work with Bitcoin. And so she is going to use um, a wallet that she selected, which is referred to as Blue Wallet. And in order to, so she starts off, she has zero Bitcoins. And you can see her balance is over here in this wallet. Um, and she has a button she can press to buy Bitcoin. Um, and that will allow her to buy some Bitcoin. She can also receive Bitcoin and she can send Bitcoin using this very simple wallet. Um, now, this particular wallet, when she clicks on the receive button, will pop up a QR code as well as an address. And so someone else who wants to send Bitcoin to Alice We'll use this address, and the QR code is really just a, a, a visual version of that address. Um, and then those Bitcoins will then appear in Alice's wallet once she receives a Bitcoin. And she can click share to share this address and QR code uh, with the person who's going to send her the Bitcoin. So this here is the receive screen on her Blue Wallet mobile Bitcoin wallet. And so if she wants to Bob to send her some Bitcoin, she would share this QR code with Bob and then he would send her the uh, Bitcoin currency. Now, presumably he's doing it in exchange for something else. Like maybe she is buying $10 worth of Bitcoin uh, so that she, she can experiment with Bitcoin and Bob is, and so she's giving Bob $10 in cash and Bob is then sending her the Bitcoin. Um, so Blue Wallet, if you want to take a look at, is just one of the many examples of mobile wallets that are out there, available on iOS and Android. Uh, and you can learn more about Blue Wallet at BlueWallet.io. Um, Trezor is an example of a hardware wallet at Trezor.io, and there are many other types of wallets, including these online and offline and paper wallets and so on. Here's a look at what a Trezor hardware uh, wallet looks like. It's got a little screen that can pop up like Bitcoin addresses and things like that. It's got a couple buttons so you can control what's going on in the small little screen. And then it's got a little USB connection to plug into a laptop or a hard uh, desktop computer. Now, nowadays, when you're setting up a wallet for the first time, you're going to set up a backup phrase so that you can recreate the wallet if you lose your wallet. Like, let's suppose, for example, you lost your hardware wallet or something went wrong and you can no longer read the screen. Well, what can you do to access your Bitcoin? Well, we can use this backup phrase to recreate this wallet on another wallet that supports the backup phrase standard. So, and this backup phrase is referred to as a mnemonic phrase. It consists of 12 to 24 English words, sometimes referred to as a seed or a seed phrase for Alice to back, to back up her wallet. Um, it'll be, 12 to 24 English words selected randomly by the software and used as a basis for the keys that are generated by the wallet. The mnemonic phrase can be used to restore all the transactions and funds in the wallet in the case of a lost mobile device, a software bug, memory corruption, or so on. So one thing to keep in mind is because you can completely recreate the wallet, you need to store that backup phrase securely. Um, someplace where you won't lose it, as well as someplace where a hacker can't steal it. So you don't want to put it online because then a hacker can get access to almost anything that's online. Uh, so you're really talking about putting your monomic phrase in a safety deposit box or a, a safe or something like that. And in fact, you might want to make two copies and put, if you're storing any substantial amount of Bitcoin, and put the two copies in two different places to prevent, you know, say the loss of one by a fire. Now, one thing to keep in mind is you should not try a do-it-yourself security scheme. 
Instead, you should follow uh, industry best practices for security. Um, the best practices were designed that way that lots of people have looked at them. Uh, if you create your own approach to security, it's likely to have uh, security vulnerabilities that you didn't spot. Uh, here's an example of the, this is what the screen would look like on that Trezor physical device we looked at a minute ago uh, when it's displaying a monomic word. Uh, it would say like write down the seed and the seventh word is garbage and then you press next and you can see the next word. So for example, this is what you would see on this little screen here and say, hey, seventh word is garbage, press next to see what the eighth word is in the monomic scheme. Here's a look at what a um, paper backup of that uh, 12 word monomic would look like. Again, we've got our seventh word is garbage. You can see the first word was army and then van, defense, carry, jealous, true, and then garbage claim, echo, media, make, and crunch. Now, uh, there is a standard for how these words are generated. Um, and the standard is several thousand words, none of which were, are very similar to each other, so you can't confuse one word with another. Um, now, it's also important that you have these words in order. That's why whatever backup you use should have a num numeric listing, like one, two, three, four, uh, because if you have van before army, it would be a different wallet than army before van. So how do people get Bitcoin in a wallet? Well, one approach to getting Bitcoin in a wallet is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, people can uh, buy some from a friend or an acquaintance in exchange for cash. Uh, they can exchange some of their national currency at a cryptocurrency exchange. They can find a Bitcoin ATM, which acts as a vending machine, uh, selling Bitcoin for cash and vice versa. Uh, you could also receive Bitcoin by uh, selling a product or service accepting payment in Bitcoin, Bitcoin. And some people even get paid in Bitcoin um, their salary or part of their salary. Now, all those methods I talked about have varying degrees of difficulty and many involve paying fees. So don't do that until you know exactly what the fees are gonna be like. Uh, and then some of those approaches will also require uh, know your customer documentation, uh, identify these identification documents like your driver's license and so on uh, for dealing with anti-money laundering uh, processes. Um, now, another question is, well, how do you know how much Bitcoin is the equivalent of, for, you know, exchanging for a dollar or a euro? Um, you know, because before you can exchange Bitcoin with someone else, you have to know what the exchange rate is between Bitcoin and the currency you're using. Um, and so the short answer as to who sets the Bitcoin price is that the price is set by markets. Uh, Bitcoin, like most other currencies, has a floating exchange rate. Uh, so the value of Bitcoin versus other currencies can fluctuate according to supply and demand in the various markets where it's traded. For example, the price of Bitcoin in US dollars is calculated in each market based on recent trades of Bitcoins and dollars. Uh, the price can fluctuate um, and a pricing service will hopefully aggregate the prices from several markets and calculate an average representing the broad market exchange rate. There are hundreds of applications and websites that provide market rates. Uh, some of the most popular ones are listed here like CoinCap and Bitcoin Average and the Chicago market, Mercantile Exchange Bitcoin Reference Rate. So here's a look at sending uh, Bitcoin. So for example, uh, Alice has decided to exchange $10 for Bitcoin. Um, so she's gonna give Joe $10 in cash. And in this particular time, uh, Bitcoin was running for $100. And so it's 0.10 BTC uh, being exchanged for $10. And in this particular case, they set a transaction fee of zero. Um, and so the address is the address where Alice is going to receive her Bitcoin. And so in order for Joe to send her the 10 Bitcoin for the $10, he just has to fill in that address and then press next. Or he could scan the QR code using the scan button.
Uh, and in this particular case, um, in the transaction note description input, uh, Joe entered Alice to reference, hey, this is a transaction with Alice. But that's only for his record, key, key, record keeping. That little comment is not going to be put on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so instead, it's just going to be saved in his wallet um, for his record, record keeping. Now, the price of Bitcoin has changed a lot over time. Um, you know, yeah, as I mentioned, that in March, you know, uh, Bitcoin hit was over fifty thousand um, dollars. Many of the examples will go through these lectures, like this one, will show Bitcoin at a different price. Uh, Bitcoin is a very vol volatile currency, and the price is constantly going up and down by quite a bit. So. Once uh, that Bitcoin is sent, then Alice will get an update in her wallet where it then show her that she's received the Bitcoin. Um, you know, the, sell the seller sent selected send, they sent it, a uh, seller provided the destination Bitcoin address, the seller typed in a transaction note for the details, and then they selected a transaction fee and then sent the units to the buyer in the Bitcoin address. Now, in general, I do recommend you include a transaction fee. In this example, they did not include a transaction fee. They said a fee is zero. Uh, but this, this example took place many years ago. Nowadays, you should use a transaction fee. And sometimes those transaction fees can be uh, relatively expensive. Uh, it's not uncommon for a transaction fee to be more than the price of a cup of coffee, or you know, sometimes a transaction fee can be as many as fifty dollars. Uh, and so, you know, Bitcoin, you're probably not going to want to do a transaction if the transaction fee is less than the price. Uh, I mean, the transaction value is less than the cost of the transaction fee. So after we do this, um, after this, the vendor sends uh, the the Bitcoin to Alice. At first, in Alice's wallet, it will show the transaction is unconfirmed. That means the transaction has been uh, pushed to the network, but it hasn't been recorded in the blockchain ledger yet. Uh, after about 10 minutes, it'll be added to the blockchain, um, and then you'll see confirmed, and then it'll say how many confirmations it have been, which is basically the number of 10-minute time blocks that has occurred since the blockchain was pushed out there. So after an hour, you should see six confirmations for your transaction. So that was a brief look at uh, an introduction to Bitcoin. Tune in next time when we will dive into chapter two of Mastering Bitcoin. Uh, but that's it for understanding uh, chapter one of Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos.